Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive, populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to establishing true democracy and creating a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. Our guest today is Leslie Gregory, president of Right to Health, a 501c3 focused on preventive health management, specifically about people concerned and or affected by stress-related risks associated with racism. So welcome to the show. Thanks. Yeah. Appreciate um, it. Yeah, so talk a little bit about uh, the genesis of the organization, how the organization start. Uh, thank you, first of all, for having me on. I just really appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, it started because I'm basically the daughter of two civil rights activists centered on health. Uh, and I think the way that it happened for my nonprofit is very much the way it happened for my parents. No one kind of sets out to be a civil rights worker. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody s really starts out to be an activist, per se, or a fighter. It just comes into their world as a necessity. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my mother was an RN, but she was denied entrance into the primary registered nursing school in my hometown because she was black. And so because of that, she had to wait. And another year went by, another, you know, during that time she continued her education and then mm -hmm. pushed and was finally let in. Same is true for my dad. Uh, he was a firefighter and the same sort of northwestern section of Ohio. Uh, and there were no supportive services for black firefighters at the time and they weren't allowed in the union so he had to start a chapter of the association international association of black firefighters so you see these things are out of necessity mm -hmm. uh, and i feel that focusing on racism in preventive health which is what i do um, is much more appropriate than speaking solely about the social determinants of health when you realize that it's kind of a code word for racism. Mm -hmm. Social determinants of health is, you know, basically a polite way of talking about racism. And so if we focus on the actual root cause, this virus, instead of just putting ibuprofen, Tylenol, fever reducers on the symptoms, mm -hmm. Uh, I think we get better traction, and again, we're talking about prevention here, not just, mm -hmm. you know, sort of yeah. symptom control. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that about your, both your mother and your father encountering these uh, barriers uh, for them based on, on race, because I, I think for a lot of white people in particular, they really don't ever see that. Right. They don't know that it happens, mm -hmm. and it's really important to say that it has happened and it continues to happen. Yes. Although it may be a little more subtle. Much more mm -hmm. subtle and I think that's the other piece um, that really gives us an insight into how to attack the issue. When we speak about these subtle things, we know that in prevention, that's exactly what we have to do. Um, we don't wait until a diabetic has an amputation. Uh, yeah. We start talking about prevention the minute the diagnosis is made. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons why we've had such a pushback from CDC. Uh, so for CDC instance, is? The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Okay, great. Uh, this is our national, if you will, it's anal analogous to what I do. Okay, so I'm a primary care practitioner. I believe CDC is basically our nation's primary care practitioner mm -hmm. uh, and their job is to prevent right and control disease so the idea is we call on them as primary care practitioners as clinicians around the country we call on them to help establish guidelines and that's their job so they have guidelines for instance on how to treat HIV what's the normal diabetic marker uh, how do we treat cardiovascular disease, some of these huge problems in our nation, and they've been declared threats to public health. So when we look at what has happened with other threats like 
heart disease, smoking, HIV, these other things, the declaration as such, the actual naming as such, this is a public health threat, has made a huge difference in the way we manage these diseases. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the same applies to racism. And, and the reason that the intensity of this campaign, I believe, is heating up is exactly because of that. We are seeing the death toll rise, uh, and that's the fourth criterion for a threat to public health, mm -hmm. that current measures are not sufficient, that we're seeing progression of this disease continue despite current efforts. And I think that's one of the criteria, that's one of the hints, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, as to the fix. Yeah, so y you and others, I presume, have taken measures, written letters, whatever, to the CDC asking or demanding uh, that they start, they start the process Correct. of recognizing that racism is a factor in healthcare. Uh, is, is that right? Absolutely. Okay. Um, I think the first letter I wrote kind of knocked over the domino and it's beginning to pile up. Uh, I think in uh, 2015 when I wrote the letter, their response was pretty sad. Uh, and I think that's the other thing that's kind of lit the, the campaign up. In essence, I outlined the four criteria and I said, you know, based on this, why have you not done this? Uh -huh. And their answer was very dismissive. I find other people reading their response are a little more angry than I was in the moment. But it was fairly dismissive saying, we don't know what to do about it. We don't have evidence-based best practice. We don't know what to do with it. Here's what we are doing. Uh, and oh, by the way, if you have any other suggestions, feel free to volunteer them. And since then, I've had other people bringing it to my attention how offensive and dismissive and disrespectful mm -hmm. that response was. And I tried not to go there in the beginning, yeah. but as time has gone by, it seems as more lives are lost, mm -hmm. that it was much more inappropriate than I, even I realized. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that's the piece that uh, people look at and say, well, so what, did you go back to them and say, well, but, but, but? And, you know, I've been told that that's not really very effective, so we need a groundswell. Uh, we need a large outcry uh, like that, which was more successful with the HIV issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I'm gay and I'm HIV, so I totally identify with what you just said because it was, um, I can't remember the name of the organization that, that, that was so effective. It, oh, the Ryan White uh, people? Uh, there are actually very many uh, yes, organizations, uh, yeah. and I think that's the other issue we're calling for mm -hmm. with, with racism. We're saying there needs to be a coalition mm -hmm. of these different voices. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think it's so interesting that you pointed this out, and of course I didn't know about your yeah. status, but yeah, you can't see. I will <laughs> say, well, exactly, yeah. that's exactly my point. Mm -hmm. You can't see it. Yeah. And that's what, again, that's what CDC's job is. If people walked around with a sign saying, uh, then um, fewer people would die of this issue. Mm -hmm. But many of these diseases are invisible. Uh, you can't see someone walking around with heart disease but we know it's one of the top killers in our country mm -hmm. and it's been declared and as soon as it was declared we saw this mortality begin to drop and that's my point mm -hmm. uh, as a national institution and not only as an institution but the racism itself has now been dis defined more in terms of the institution uh, it is the job uh, of CDC to do this, to mm -hmm. call this out. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's the other reason why people are so frustrated right. at the little bit of progress we've made. Yeah, so your your preference, your preferred response from the CDC would have been something along the lines of, we haven't recognized this as a problem in the past. Clearly they haven't. We will start working on it or we will we will what? Well, I think there were several opportunities just in that letter mm -hmm. uh, to be to move forward. I think the first would be 
that they just declare it. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. say, you know, okay, well, we'll declare it, and then your in, your organization, other organizations around the nation, if they, if you had come to us with some of your solutions, then you know, once we declared it, those solutions will yeah. then be mm -hmm. because the issue is we know that there are protocols already in place for mm -hmm. you know once something's declared a threat to public health, we know there are protocols in place, um, and I think the other piece I think of it is people push back on me to say, well, what do you want them to do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I guess my point is... And that's kind of what I was just asking. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that, and right, I think yeah. my point mm -hmm. is, uh, like any other chronic disease, first you diagnose it, mm -hmm. and then you find out what you have to do next. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, so when people ask me, what is, what is it going to require? And I think the first step is the courage to call it out. Yeah. So the first step, yeah, have the courage to call it out. I'm more than happy to suggest. I have a very detailed, multidisciplinary, multifaceted approach. But each of it, each of those facets, each of those approaches is predicated upon the first step. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know. So when people ask me, well, what do you want them to do about it? I say simply, Speak its name. Make the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Yes, we know that. You cannot see it if you can't say it. Yeah, right. right. Uh -huh. uh, and for instance, uh, with other chronic diseases, diabetes is a perfect example. Uh, you know, you can talk about someone's leg being amputated, but if you don't even look at what they're eating first, is that not, mm -hmm. you know, illogical to jump to the sixth step before you've even mm -hmm. opened the door. So I think that's another one of those things that we look at and think it's a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. And yet this institution has failed to take that first simple step. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you're, you're, you're going to, you are, you are going to continue to push them to do that. Uh, yes, and in fact, I think one of the things that really needs to be brought into the room in this conversation is the urgency of the matter. Mm -hmm. um, we, a group of anti-racist activists will be testifying at a congressional hearing in April. Oh, okay. And what we would like to do is bring back this campaign and petition on a zip drive and present it to them and say, you know, we have tens and hopefully a hundred thousand people who agree mm -hmm. and we'd like you to respond in a more definitive public you know media driven way so that people who are suffering and have been for a very long time can have their concerns validated uh, another step we'd like to see taken is change uh, in policy mm -hmm. uh, so for instance one of the things we'll be discussing is the fact that uh, again, CDC has some real work to do to catch up to their own mandate. Uh, and in the particular example that we'll be talking about, for instance, in pain management, uh, when the Surgeon General made this edict about over the uh, opioid overdose epidemic that we're speaking about, mm -hmm. this declaration was made in a in an inappropriate field already. So for instance, CDC has guidelines about how to manage the pain of sickle cell disease. It's a very painful uh, condition. It's primarily suffered uh, by people of color. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they're already not being treated to these guidelines. Mm -hmm. So sickle cell patients are suffering a tremendous amount of pain. And because of the presentation, they appear to have these crises and then show up in ERs and they can be mistaken for what's colloquially called the frequent flyer. It is not appropriate for these patients to sit in pain and wait or be turned away or you know, be undertreated for their pain mm -hmm. when CDC has already made these guidelines on how they should be treated. They're not. And so we see a high rate of suicidality in this population, uh, depression, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And so once this edict by Surgeon General about the opioids was put out, this segment of the population 
was marginalized even more mm. and damaged, harmed, aggressively harmed by a system that was already not paying yeah. the kind of attention. And so what we're asking is if our primary care and health centered institutions could just have taken, you know, five minutes to think about a way that they could inform the public in a more compassionate way. Mm -hmm. And one, again, in keeping with their own policies. We're not asking about new policies, new budgets, new amendments. These are things that are already not being done to their own guidelines. Mm, okay. So my example when people say, well, what do you want to have done? I quote a brilliant woman, Dr. Kamara Jones, who says, just look at everything through this lens. Stop asking, is racism at play here? And say, it is. Where is racism yes. at play here? Mm -hmm. So Surgeon General would have, instead of this blanket edict, thought just five minutes to contact these special populations and say, look, this does not apply to you. Mm -hmm. We're going to set aside a space for you, mm -hmm. okay? And yet we can still do both. You know, we're, we're, we're not 12 year olds. Mm -hmm. The light is not either on or off. We have rheostats. Yes. How about this segment of the population that has special concerns, mm -hmm. special needs? You will be excluded. Let's look at the real issue mm -hmm. about this opioid epidemic and let's protect those individuals who are already at risk. Mm -hmm. And so this would have been an example, for instance, of how Surgeon General might have done due diligence mm -hmm. prior to this sort of blanket mm -hmm. statement that has now done a great deal of damage. Yeah, it really seems like uh, while we all want to be created, uh, all be, we all want to be treated equally. In order to be treated equally, we have to recognize there are differences between people, and then treat appropriately. Absolutely, yeah. a and more. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I appreciate the way you brought that up because it was just so exquisitely demonstrative of, of our point. The subtle difference, and let's face it, America has never been good at subtlety. No. <laughs> uh, but the nuanced approach is what we're asking for, just a nuanced approach, which is what medicine is all about, would have been to demonstrate the difference between, as you call it, equality and equity. Yes. There uh -huh. are two, you know, how close those words are, mm -hmm. but how far apart they are in practice. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I love that. And I mean, I think that brings another option for addressing this issue uh, into the room, which is the exquisite nature of our language. Uh, and I think Another reason CDC needs to be involved in this is that there is no segment of our culture that is not affected, nor has a role to play mm -hmm. in addressing this issue, and one of them is linguistics. We really need to learn how to speak to each other in a way that is encompassing, inclusive, and safe for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, this idea of equality, it's quite lofty. But what is really appropriate is equity. Yes, right. Yeah. And when we talk about health equity, this is again the specific mandate of CDC. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I long ago saw a picture that uh, that showed the difference between equity and equality. I think and I know. the equality one, there are three three boys at a fence. Exactly. And they're looking, trying to look over the fence. And the shortest boy, there is no way he's going to look over, over the fence. And the uh, the uh, middle middle height boy can kind of, but not quite. And the, right. uh, the tallest one, no problem. He's looking over the fence. And so, equity would give each one of those the same height step ladder to stand on to try. And the smallest boy 
can't, still can't see over. Mm -hmm. The middle boy is much closer to seeing over, maybe, maybe, still maybe not. And the tallest boy clearly still can see over. So that's treating them equally. But the equity would give that smallest boy a taller ladder so he could see over too. That was always such a great picture. It's so I love it. Great. I love it. Just one other little, not to beat the equity uh, meme to death, yeah. but I say we should go a little bit further. Mm -hmm. From equality to equity to compassion. Yeah. And for me, the image of compassion is get rid of the fence. Uh, yeah. <laughs> get rid of the fence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why do we have a fence around a I think what they were watching was baseball. Yes, and I think the thing that gets me the most is American sport is baseball. Mm -hmm. Why do we have a fence mm -hmm. around it mm -hmm. at all? And I think this is where we're going uh, with our campaign is to say, yeah, sure, maybe CDC sees itself as doing its minimal due diligence. But my point is, if we're truly the greatest nation, if we're truly going abroad to hammer other countries for their civil rights violations, <laughs> human rights violations. Mm -hmm. And if we are also a Christian nation, then my question would be, why do we not attend the moat in our own eye? Mm -hmm. uh, so, thus, we see more clearly the common ground of all of our eyes to address that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another disappointment that I have. You know, as a veteran in this country, there was a reason that I thought about the promise of democracy that we spread and, you know, promulgate around the nation, mm -hmm. around the world. Mm -hmm. And I can't help but think if I were France, Vietnam, some of these other countries, I would look at the United States and say, you have so much. Mm -hmm. How is it that you have so much suffering among your own people, mm -hmm. and yet you venture out into the rest of the uh, world yes, and say right. what others should be doing? Uh, yeah, right. Uh, yeah, and of course, we really know the answer to that question. The answer to the question is that there is a tremendous amount of profit in war. Yeah. Yeah. Well, th I think there's also, you know, that's a great, that's a great point you bring up. Mm -hmm. I think there's a great deal of profit in health inequity as well. Yes. Um, and there are those who feel that we have a war going on here mm -hmm. against our own people. And I think that's another place where our hypocrisy is showing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is another reason and example of racism as a threat to public health. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have a petition on your website. Talk about the petition. So I do. And I think that one of the things that people need to have in the face of these inequities and these continuing atrocities is an action step. And so we are asking people to go to our campaign on moveon.org and agree with us that racism is a threat to public health. And that's all you have to do, actually, is just mm -hmm. go to the moveon.org website, type in racism and public health, and the uh, campaign comes up. Oh, okay. All right. But, but, but people can go to your website, and there's a... There's a link to there's that. A link to uh, that. There's a link on our Facebook page. Um, we tweet uh, periodically about mm -hmm. it. I'd love to have more people tweeting, mm -hmm. uh, because we just can't do this on our own. And that's the other thing we're really asking people to do, is participate in the campaign, and again, think like uh, Dr. Jones, when she says, look at things through a lens so that it's not just, you know, once in a while you think about it, maybe you'll bring it into the room. If you think about your world mm -hmm. in this frame, when you walk down the street and you see a person of color, uh, back in the day, we used to see each other on the street and smile just a little nod, just a little I see you mm -hmm. um, body language. This is a way you can keep it in the room so that people don't feel so marginalized. Mm -hmm. uh, the way that you can reach out and shake a hand, someone that you don't know, a smile instead of a downward gaze, yeah. instead of pulling yourself to the side of the sidewalk away from someone mm -hmm. who doesn't look like you. 
uh, there are just so many ways that we can subtly reverse what has been a subtly transmitted disease mm -hmm. over all this time. Mm -hmm. uh, those are other things that people can do. I think the other thing uh, a brilliant individual once said to me, what can you, you know, he asked, what can you do against racism? Uh, Dr. James Mason said, do you? And I thought that was a very brilliant thing to do. If you're a part of a sewing bee or a quilting club or a Christian group or, you know, whatever your hobby is, whatever your job is, your avocation, uh, approach it with this anti-racist lens mm -hmm. and you'll begin to see tremendous opportunities to make small steps in your own community, in your own circle. Mm -hmm. You know, call up, what about that Baptist church on the other side of town? Call them, say, you know, would you like to be our sister church? We'd like to swap out pastors for mm -hmm. a, a Sunday or two. Uh, I think there's a tremendous role uh, in fighting racism in the Christian right. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. we've heard that uh, it's the most segregated hour of the day is Sunday morning. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you're right about yeah. that, yeah. So I'm, I'm sorry, but our time is up. Wow. Yeah, it went quickly. <laughs> it really did. Yeah, right, yeah. So I hope that people will go to your, your website and sign your petition, and I hope that uh, we'll have you back on again. Great. Great, thank you. <laughs> Great. Terrific. Good. Our guest today has been Leslie Gregory, president of the Right to Health, concerned with the health equity gap especially as associated with racism. Learn more about the Right to Health at right numeral to healthus.org. Looking forward to the November 2020 ballot. Our friends at the Oregon Progressive Party have started collecting signatures on 2020-001, which would amend the Oregon Constitution to allow limits on campaign contributions and expenditures. You can help us get big special interest money out of Oregon elections. Contact me for signature sheets via email at davidafd at ymail.com or go to our website or.honest-elections.com. Sign the petition at the bottom of the home page. Just print it, sign it, and mail it in. Remember that you can watch Populist Dialogues anytime on YouTube. Just search for Populist Dialogues to find our YouTube channel. And to receive notification when a new program is added, just click on subscribe when watching a program. Thank you for watching this program today. I hope we'll see you again soon. Bye. Good job.